It's now time to actually introduce another international guest. Uh, she's been with us for the whole conference and it's been wonderful having her around. Uh, Mary Kane became President and CEO of Sister Cities International uh, in October of 2011. And uh, she leads the membership, youth and education, uh, development and advocacy programs to strengthen the Sister City network around the world. And prior to joining Sister Cities uh, International, she was an executive director with the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, where she was responsible for identifying and building business partnerships and strategic alliances for the Chamber. And before joining the Chamber, um, Ms Kane was the Secretary of State in Maryland and a former Assistant States Attorney. Uh, she serves on several boards and is a graduate of the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. Uh, she's actually going to co go back to America after this conference, then back to Guangzhou, where she's going to be spending Thanksgiving. So it's peaking duck for Thanksgiving. And I told her that given Australia entirely relies on Chinese uh, iron ore purchases, we also have peaking duck for our Thanksgiving. Uh, please put your hands together for Ms Mary Kane. Good morning. Great to see everyone. I have to do one thing. I have a wonderful communications director, and she is always telling me I have to tweet. So everybody smile. I'm going to take a picture of you so that I can post this and tweet this out to everyone. OK. Um, good morning. Let me begin by thanking Mayor Brennan, Deputy Mayor Kelly, and the Bunbury City team, the Bunbury Council members, Bill Wilson, of course, the executive team of Sister Cities Australia, everyone from Setagaya, our friends from Clare, and most especially all of you wonderful delegates from the Sister Cities all over Australia that are here today. Congratulations on a very successful conference. I think John Castrilli said it best yesterday morning when he spoke of the beliefs and commonalities that we all share. We sometimes forget that no matter where we live, what we look like, what religion we practice, or where we went to school, that we're all people of this one planet. We all love and want the best for our families, for our communities, and for our countries. And I just want to remind you that as members of Sister Cities Australia, you are part of a very large international network of sister cities across the world. And as president of Sister Cities International, I'm always amazed at our history in the United States. 56 years ago, on September 11th, President Eisenhower convened the White House Conference on Citizen Diplomacy in Washington, DC. He told delegates that, and I quote, two deeply held convictions unite us in common purpose. First is our belief in effective and responsive local government as a principal bulwark of freedom. And second is our faith in the great promise of people to people and sister city affiliations in helping build the solid structure of world peace and prosperity. In the early 1950s, President Eisenhower stated that many methods can be used to develop greater under international understanding, but none can be more effective than direct, close, and abiding communications between cities, where indeed most of our people now live. There we go. At Sister Cities International, we firmly believe that global connections help communities thrive, and we've seen this widespread benefits of globalization among our own cities. Can I go back? Or, here we go. I've hit it too many times. According to a recent McKinsey report, an international consulting firm, over the next 12 years, 600 cities throughout the world will account for nearly 65% of global GDP growth. I went to Ghana and Kenya to attend the opening of our health, sanitation, and water projects, and to launch our new Sino-Africa initiative that had been funded through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. By the way, Sister Cities International, and one of the reasons I need to get home quickly, 
will be receiving an award for this program, the United Nations Office for South to South Cooperation, 2014 South to South Cooperation for Partnership Award will be given to Sister Cities International on Friday. And the participants in our Sino-Africa Award were US cities that had relationships with China and Africa, and they were asked to participate in a trilateral program. The basis of this program was to address the manner in which Chinese, American, and African cities can collaborate on economic development and urban poverty issues in Africa. After an initial meeting in Nairobi to determine next steps, each city spent the next two years working on a project in their African sister city and participating in trade missions to the US and China. Your theme of peaceful coexistence basically sums up this program, that peace and prosperity can only be accomplished if we bring out the best in each other. And during the Sino-Africa Initiative, we not only brought out the best in each other, we actually had to dress like each other, but we made each, each city better by not only working together, but identifying our strengths and weaknesses. As we were touring one of the villages in Ghana and cutting the new ribbon on a new sanitation facility, I heard one of the villagers' cell phones ring. Here we were opening sanitation facilities in a very remote village, yet their residents are connected. In this new era of citizen diplomacy, we have also been emphasizing the benefits of economic development opportunities with your sister cities. And this is part of Eisenhower's vision of peace and prosperity. Studies done by the Brookings Institution, a think tank in Washington, DC, have shown that cities are the drivers of the future global economy because they are centers for all the resources for economic growth. Cities are the hubs for exports and imports, movement of goods, and innovation. And in addition to bringing in business and trade, global connections help residents reap countless benefits including more jobs, better infrastructure, and international education programs. Last year, in conjunction with the US uh, State Department, we hosted a delegation of subnational officials from South Africa. And these mayors were eager to showcase their cities as hubs for manufacturing and trade. They invited investors to South Africa with open arms. They saw the importance of, global, of the global market and its place in their cities. And in fact, during our conference with the South African mayors, the mayors pointed out the challenges faced by many cities across the world are strikingly similar. Waste management challenges, infrastructure woes, and high pollution levels are not issues confined to one particular country. In fact, on a reciprocal visit to South, South Africa, I went to visit the water department in Richards Bay. They have installed a water monitoring system that Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live, would die for. You can see up on these large monitors in this one room every single connection. They can see a leak on the monitor. They can shut down the water going to that area and send out the right crews immediately to fix the problem. I know we can't do that. It was just amazing, and how much we learned by watching them do that. How did they implement this? Cities with global connections can partner to work and learn from each other for the benefit of their residents. Taking your state to the world or your city to the world is not only good business, it's good governance. How can sister cities help? Sister city relationships are avenues for cities to connect globally. I always remind our members that you are part, and you are too, part of our network that is comprised of 525 cities with over 2,000 partnerships in 146 countries on six continents. Sister Cities Australia is part of that movement. Your sister city commission can be considered as a global organization building ties for Australia around the world. And don't set, just a little word of advice, don't set arbitrary limits nor cut off ties because of political differences or brief periods of inactivity. 
Sister state, sister city relationships are deep and existing connections that states can leverage for their community's overall benefit. Don't give up because you may have an election and things go down a little bit and you think, oh, nobody's gonna take this over. There will be somebody that'll come along. And, if, and frankly, it's very offensive when people cut off sister cities to, that, to the, your, that community that you're partnered with. We have one great example of how sister cities work. We had this um, in August in 2011. There was this Lakeland, Florida, a very small city, engineering firm, only 22 people that worked in that firm. And that, but there was one gentleman, one of the engineers, who was adamant. He felt really closed in and wasn't getting to see anything or experience anything outside of Lakeland, Florida. And Lakeland is a pretty much a very, you know, um, typical Florida town. So we went to the owner of the company and he said, you know, we just need to do something. We need to reach out. Do you mind if I join that local Chinese sister city down group that they have down um, meet once a week? So the owner, not even thinking twice about it, said, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. So um, then the owner started to get a little bit more involved and they did three different delegations back and forth. And on the third delegation, this 22 person um, engineering firm received a five year, $1 billion US, uh, US dollar contract to build a theme park outside of Shanghai in, in their sister city. And they beat out Disney, they were very excited. Um, but it's just those local connections, those connections. What, how else would this gentleman with his engineering firm have gotten the opportunity to bid on something like that in China without first going through the motions of developing all these relationships? As a result of connections that, that the CEO of Econ made when he visited the chi China as part of his official sister city delegation, it was, um, he was quite... He was quite thrilled. Another story that we have, the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, and I actually talked to the gentleman yesterday that spoke. Um, in Charleston, South Carolina, Joe Riley, their mayor, commented that his sister city partnership with Spoleto, Italy, brings in $30 million annually to the local economy. They started a small Italian festival, probably about 20 years ago, and now, it's the biggest Italian festival on the east coast of the United States. And people come from all over the world. It just started very small. But everybody wants to be part of that. So people would come from all over the, all over the world to take part. And this past year, A.T. Kearney, a research organization that produces an annual Global Cities Index, which evaluates healthy, growing communities started to include the number of sister cities that a community has in its evaluation criteria. They now look at your global connections and what you're doing to reach out to the rest of the world as part of the um, well-being of your city. And that's what businesses also look to. A recent article in Next City promoted sister city relationships as innovation ecosystems that can fuel urban economic development. And this idea of sister cities originated in the private sphere, but is gaining traction in the public sector. For example, Chicago recently signed a trade agreement with eight cities in Mexico, realizing their city is home to the second largest concentration of Mexican immigrants in the United States. Both cities have suffered through deindustrialization and have now joined forces to promote global firms such as Siemens. But this is not limited to large urban centers. In fact, Thomas Friedman, who's author of The World is Flat, pointed out that corporate icon Michael Dell of Dell Computers states that 96% of our potential customers, and he was talking about the United States, live outside of America. And he is right. If you have a business and a computer with internet connections, you can participate in international trade. And think about it. Sister city relationships are the best way to, to foster economic development opportunities and to build them. And when you do this, when both cities are better for having known each other, that's how you build peace and prosperity. That's how you have a peaceful coexistence. Because when you look at it and you think about it, business 
is all based on strong relationships and trust. And that's what we bring to those um, business deals. And with the hardworking, positive, welcoming people in Australia, building strong personal relationships is not even that difficult. It's part of your nature. But I need your help to continue the remarkable force of Sister Cities International. In the United States and Australia, we need to strengthen our long-term relationships and start new sister cities, sister states, and sister counties. We need to celebrate our relationships with Germany and Japan, Ireland, Russia, Mexico, and China. But we also need to start growing relationships in the Middle East and North Africa. We need to increase our friendships in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that may make some people feel very uncomfortable. But think of the people that went before us, like President Eisenhower, when he asked, them, when he asked us to build relationships with Japan and Germany after World War II. That must have been very uncomfortable for some people. But they did it. And now look at those relationships. They're amazing. Today, for instance, Honolulu, Hawaii, and Hiroshima, Japan, have a very strong sister cities relationship. Now, if those two cities can do this, I think we can reach out and do it with many other cities. I don't think anyone in our country or in Japan ever thought such a relationship would exist 65 years later. And I took to heart yesterday Bill Wilson's story and it was a great reminder of why people become part of sister cities. He was a Vietnam vet, and he never wanted his children to experience war. That happens a lot. But if people don't know about us, they won't know to join us, especially our returning soldiers. And Bill, it's a great reason to be the chair of Sister Cities Australia. This is what our communication, our means of communication looked like 65 years ago. Today, we have something our predecessors did not. We have technology. That complaint that it is too expensive to travel is no longer a legitimate excuse. At Sister Cities International, we are promoting digital diplomacy. And now, in 2014, we have so many more tools for people-to-people -people connections. The internet, Skype, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, new ways to connect seem to be invented every day. So there is no reason to lose touch with your family throughout the world. As an international and national network, Sister Cities is embracing technology because it is a fantastic tool for promoting peace and prosperity. We are on Facebook and Twitter we have an interactive website, and we are accessible to not only our members in the US, but our friends around the world. Let me give you some examples of um, things that have happened as far as Facebook and Twitter and all the other means of communications. My daughter, Grace, a couple of years ago, um, was asked to go to Iraq. Her best friend growing up um, is a woman named Aveen. And Avin's father and mother had to leave Iraq over 30 years ago because of Saddam Hussein. So they settled in the United States. Her father was a neurosurgeon at George Washington University Hospital. And her mother was a homemaker. Well, um, when the war started in Iraq, Dr. Kareem decided to get back involved. He decided that he was going to run for governor of Kirkuk. And he won. And so in 2009, he became the governor. Uh, 2011, his wife, who had not been there in 30 years, and Avin, who had never been to Iraq, were going to go over. And they asked my daughter, Grace, to go with them. And I had talked to a few people. And I knew at this time it was OK. And, um, but my parents, my parents are Irish, Catholic, wonderful immigrants. And they adore their granddaughter, Grace. And I just did, I couldn't tell them that Grace was going to Iraq for two weeks. I knew that they would be lighting every candle up and down the churches on the East Coast. 
just beside themselves that Grace was going to be in Iraq. So at the end of the two weeks, I, fi I see my mother. I've been avoiding her calls. And um, I walk in, and I'm just feeling so guilty. I said, oh, Grace is in Iraq. She's on her way home. My father went, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Oh, my God, Grace is in Iraq. And he just, he was like beside himself. And I'm like, oh, I knew this was going to happen. And so I looked at my mom, and she looked really calm. And I said, you don't look too upset. She goes, well, I knew. I said, well, how did you know? She goes, Facebook. <laughs> I said, oh, my God. I said, and you didn't tell him? And she goes, no, look at him. How would I deal with that for two weeks? So. <laughs> but look at that connection. It's amazing. And it keeps people involved. And it keeps you learning about everyone that's, what else is going on out there? I mean, I had no idea that I wasn't getting those pictures on Facebook. I guess I'm in a little box somewhere, as, but, but my mother gets to, to see everything. As the Secretary of State in Maryland, I was the chairperson of the Governor's Subcabinet on International Affairs. And it was, the, um, it was an amazing thing to go over to Estonia, which uh, Estonia became one of our sister states. And our Maryland National Guard was, part, was with the war when it was taking place, Estonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina. And I was not excited about going to Estonia. Shame on me. I looked, you know, looked at what had happened there, and I'm thinking it's a damp, war-torn country. It's not going to be that great. Um, so I kind of put it off. I finally get to Estonia, and the woman that I'm with t picks me up at the airport, takes me to this beautiful city of Tallinn. And remember, this is nine years ago. She takes me to this wonderful city, and we're looking for a parking space, and she pulls out her cell phone, and she starts, I said, what are you doing? What are you doing with your cell phone? She goes, oh, that's right. You still have parking meters, don't you? I said, oh my goodness. And I'm thinking of that parking garage we're just building in Bethesda, Maryland, with all the new parking meters. The entire country is wireless. You can go out, nine years ago, you go into a park in Estonia and pull up your laptop and go to work. Their parliament is paperless. Their elections are online. So I came back and I'm like, we have a lot to learn from the people in Estonia. Something that I had no idea before I went there. And digital diplomacy. There was a great example of it yesterday when the Bunbury runners in Setagaya, Japan, came on and said hi to everybody. That's not a one-off. That can be done every day through Skype, which started in Estonia, by the way. Um, it's just something we have to get used to. It's a little bit uncomfortable, and we're stepping outside the box. And it's not intuitive, at least for most of us my age. It's not. It's not something that comes naturally, but we have to do it. And congratulations on an extraordinary um, free trade agreement that was signed by your prime minister yesterday with um, President Xi Jinping. Let me tell you of a story that we have there. In February 2012, the United States had the honor of hosting then Vice President Xi Jinping. And the plan was that, the Vice, Pres that Vice President Xi would visit Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. What the State Department, the U.S. State Department, did not know was that almost three decades earlier, Vice President Xi, now President Xi, stayed with a host family in Muscatine, Iowa, as part of a sister state delegation. During his visit in, in that time, he insisted on paying a visit to his host family and friends who were still living in Iowa. So think of the U.S. Department of State when they're told, oh my goodness, you, we have to land this whole contingent in the middle of Iowa, which is in the middle of the country, basically. In 1985, Xi Jinping was a civil servant in a provincial ministry of agriculture. He stayed in his host family's high school son's bedroom with posters of Star Wars on the walls. And clearly, his 1985 journey made a very lasting impression on him. 
During his trip in 2011, he, or, the soon-to-be president of China discussed economic opportunities in agriculture with Iowa officials. And by the end of this very quick visit, where he did sit in the living room and have tea with his host family and friends, um, an agreement was made at the World Food Prize Center in Des Moines, Iowa, for China to purchase $4.3 billion worth of soybeans from Iowa. And this is just one of the amazing things that happened through sister cities. We're not really good at blowing our own horns or telling these stories, although we need to get better at it. We need to tell people why these are good. This is an amazing thing that this man who is now president of China, which has 1.3 billion people, his first visit to the US was on his sister state's delegation. That says a lot. And when I went to the dinner in Des Moines, Iowa, I had, was very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, the, he stood up and he said, when I think of Americans, I think of my host family. And I don't think you can get a better recommendation for sister cities than that. Sister city relationships help cities to connect globally. They help open doors, make long-term business and trade partners, and form friendships across the world. But there's so much more to sister cities. We are, we're building a new sports diplomacy program. You really need, we need our next generation involved. And we have to reach out to where they are. And sports is one of the ways to do that. Just a few weeks ago, we held our first Sister Cities International Football Bowl, American football. Tuscaloosa, Alabama, hosted a semi-pro football team from Japan, their sister city, from their sister city in Japan. 185 people came from Japan to Tuscaloosa for this momentous event. The Japanese football team was then hosted by a very famous college coach named Nick Saban and the Crimson Tide for the afternoon. And I realized, I knew we had, this was, a big thing that's come, apart, come because of sports diplomacy, but I realized it had to be a real big part of our program too, was when I got to visit an orphanage in Kenya through the, um, one of our grants. These young children had lost their parents to AIDS. And when I arrived, they were playing soccer outside. They had nothing, they didn't have shoes, but they set up their own arbitrary goals and they had a ball. And when we went inside and saw the boys' bedroom with four sets of bunk beds, and on the wall, they had painted a perfect replica of the Manchester United emblem. And that's basically all they had. Sports brings people together. It's healthy competition. And we intend to grow this area of Sister Cities International. But I know sometimes this scares people who have been involved for a long time. We're talking about technology, we're talking about sports, we're talking about business. But I, I, I do want to reassure you that Sister Cities International will stick with our traditions that are rooted in citizen diplomacy efforts. We will highlight our universal love of our families. We will continue to embrace our diverse cultures as benefits to our communities. We will strive to engage our youth all over the world through programs like our Young Artist and Authors Showcase. Please, we would love to have you participate in that. We've now um, added movies to our Young Artist and Authors Showcase, short films. And we'll participate in all different kinds of um, educational exchanges. Recently at the United Nations, we announced our new partnership with the New York Academy of Sciences. The Global STEM Alliance will work with sister cities to identify mentors and mentees throughout the network to expand STEM education, science, technology, um, engineering, and math. We will continue the strong emphasis on humanitarian assistance. We will be the first people there when we experience tragedies like the tsunami in Japan, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, the floods in Midwest America, and the earthquakes in China. 
I hope you realize that you are part, we're, we're not there alone, you're part of that family. I had a member from Rockford, Illinois, who always heard me talk about this family, this network, does it really work, whatever, you know, kind of wanted to test me out. So he and his wife were going to England, specifically Newcastle on Tyne. Well, it's not a sister city of Rockford or any other city in Illinois, but it is the sister city for Atlanta. So Jay decided he would call our folks in Atlanta, and he told them that he was going there. When Jay and Holly arrived, the mayor and town council greeted them, took them to dinner, and made sure that they were welcomed. Jay called me and he said he felt guilty, he had no idea the network was that powerful. In return, now Jay is helping us to measure our impact by gathering data on our network. That's part of our big problem. And if you guys have any thoughts and you can give me any advice, we have to gather the data. How many um, exchanges do we have? How many people are involved? How many people are coming to conferences? What are the different, what are the age ranges? Because if you're like every other sister city program and just like me, you need funding. And if you want funding, you have to be able to give people numbers to tell them why they should fund you and to show the impact that you're having. We're not really good at it. I know we aren't in the United States, but we're trying. And any, anything we can, you can do to help us and anything we can do to help you, we're there. But we need to, to find out the hundreds of thousands of people who are affected by sister cities throughout the whole world. And as many of you know, the President of the United States has always been the honorary chairman of Sister Cities International since Eisenhower. In March of 2015, we will be having a diplomatic gala in Washington, D.C., and inviting local officials, administration officials, members of Congress, and corporate representatives to celebrate the success of our 58-year-old network. Um, the National League of Cities will also be in town. It will also be the start of our U.S. State Department's Global Initiatives Week, which will be reaching out to everyone in our network um, with more information. I'd love to invite you to come to Washington, D.C. in March. It can be kind of nice, maybe a little chilly, a little bit colder than here. But if you're lucky, you get to see the cherry blossoms. We will also have a um, conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota next July, which, once again, you're all invited to come. Anyone who's part of Sister Cities is invited to come. I promise you, you will not be disappointed if you go to either one of these. Um, great events. And I look forward to working with you, the members of Sister Cities Australia, to build stronger connections and relationships between our different groups to create peace and prosperity, to have peaceful coexistence. And every day I ask you to think about and spread our new tagline that we have for Sister Cities International, that when you connect globally, you thrive locally. And I thank you very much for the honor to speak to you today, and congratulations on a very successful conference. I'll take any questions, if, any, if that's OK. If anybody has any questions? Um, ladies and gentlemen, very kind. We will encourage questions, and there is one at the back straight away. Uh, I'm going to do the job of running a microphone around if someone delivers one to me. Maybe we'll just get you to use just, your voice. Sorry, I so, kind of did this off the. I can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. That's terrible. Okay. Our Twitter handle is at Sister Cities INT International. My Twitter handle is at CEO ATSCI. Okay, and um, I don't know why you can't find the Facebook page, but. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we've got one. Okay. Um, David Byatt from Bunbury. Mary, hugely inspirational. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, I'll, my question is regarding funding issues with sister cities, given that we're caught in the, uh, you know, the electric, electoral cycle, three or four years, um, and of course it's always budget-based, but we deal with intangible goods rather mm -hmm. than tangible mm -hmm. goods, and trying to show the value and worth of sister cities, especially to local governments, and to, to, um, to then to secure funding is a huge mm -hmm. challenge. And we have to revisit it time and time again. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that, um, that Assisted Cities International is doing to establish guidelines for being able to assess the effects of Assisted City relationships, exchanges? I mean, for example, mm -hmm. we go back to people who have been on exchange 20 years ago, and we always find that that exchange has been a significant impact on their life. But how do you measure that in dollars? And mm -hmm. how do you then show your local, local government and those people that mm -hmm. are skeptical about the sister city that there is value there? and they should, uh, they, they should be assessing it in one way or another. It is the biggest problem that we have because sister cities and the relationships, it's not like you can push a button and it happens tomorrow. That's why you have to gather stories like President Xi Jinping. Because as I tell a lot of um, groups of students that come to visit us, I said, I don't know which one of you will be the president of Mexico one day. Maybe this is what will be the impetus to make you do that. Maybe you'll go home and talk to your father who runs a big factory who wants to do business here. You know, it's, but it's, um, it is. And we're trying to figure that out. That's why we're going through, we're gonna be doing a lot of surveys this year and getting the numbers. If you can find out how to get the numbers of people affected by sister cities in your community, you have to remember, they're voters. So if you have all of those people and you can show numbers like that to elected officials, you're talking about a strong voting block. You kind of have to look in the other person's place of what they need. We reach out to Congress all the time and let them know this is what's happening in your, in your state or your congressional district with sister cities. But it's counting, 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 because we are a data-driven society, and it's really important. We're still working on it. You can check our website, let you know as soon as we get that up there. <laughs>